I was just listening, for a little bit at least, to uh, some music on the, the radio, uh, Hotel California. And as this guy is approaching this Hotel California, he says, this could be heaven or this could be hell. And of course, what's he doing? He's borrowing language from Jesus. He's borrowing language. He's giving dignity to uh, his poetry, borrowing from the great power that there is in the gospel message in which Jesus warns that uh, those who do not see God and those who do not obey him will walk in the straight and narrow path. Those who go the broad way will find themselves in a place he called hell, a place of fire. And the book of Revelation uh, uh, repeats the idea that you have in Jesus' teaching. Also, uh, Peter, first Peter, or second Peter, uh, chapter three, discusses the whole idea of the end, the end of the world, the destruction of the, the old heavens and the earth. Here in, in Isaiah, we're told that uh, God is going to create a new heavens and a new earth. That's in verse 17. Isaiah 65 and verse 17. He says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered. What's the verse? The first verse in the Bible, Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Here he says, Behold, I create, same language, I create new heavens and a new earth. And in 2 Peter, he also says, beyond the discussion of the destruction of the heavens and the earth, he says God will create a new heaven and a new earth. And it's this language. It comes from right here. Now, uh, this is a part of the last... Uh, the last uh, chapter and the last of 65 and into chapter 66 uh, when he uh, in verse 1 in chapter 66 he says heaven is my throne the earth is my footstool what is a house that you would build for me uh, he speaks of peace like a river in verse 12 and he winds up the discussion uh, talking about evangelism and how the, that the, uh, the glory of God would be carried to all the nations that they might know his glory, that they might see his glory. Now that is the theme in the New Testament. It, it comes directly from these verses and of course from the mind of God. So... Uh, as we study these chapters, I, I think we're going to find, um, again, a, a little bit of, of confusion, not confusion, but let's say a challenge to our thinking and imagination. Uh, there has been debate and division in recent years over the idea uh, that Second Peter, when he talks about the new heavens and the earth, new earth, and that Isaiah and all of the other scriptures that talk about uh, heaven and hell uh, are not talking about um, literally the destruction of the heavens and the earth and literally a, the creation of a new heaven and a new earth, but rather that, that uh, he's talking about the destruction of uh, the, the sinful practices of the past and of uh, the, the setting aside of the old order and the establishing of the new order. Uh, that is, of, uh, of, of the church, of the gospel, of the kingdom of God. Now, they can argue 
uh, very forcefully, and, and those of you talk to those who have the AD 70 theory, uh, and they get really absorbed by some of this stuff, and they can make some pretty convincing arguments. I think it's nearsighted, and I think it's not, re it's not being open-minded to what God is trying to express here. This is a thing that all of this debate has helped me to see. I don't deny that in some of our sermons and preaching, uh, there are scriptures that have been misused and applied to the end uh, of time, such as in Matthew 24, when all of that chapter is devoted, uh, certainly primarily, uh, the language that is used to refer to the coming of Christ and the destruction, uh, that language is applied to the destruction of Jerusalem, without a doubt. Um, and but what's not being recognized about Second Peter and about Isaiah and about the book of Revelation is there is a dual theme here and you cannot miss it he's talking about both things uh, and we have mentioned that earlier in the book of Isaiah when he's talking about the present time and a future time now, he does that same kind of thing here. The, when he talks about the new heavens and the new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered, look at it carefully, and you can see. I mean, when he talks about even uh, every tear shall be wiped away, as you also have in the book of Revelation. Um, the immediate idea is the, the pardon of God. It's the immediate idea is the transformation of sinful men. Uh, the, the immediate idea is that, uh, that we will be uh, a new people and that God will create a new world for us in the sense of what he does in the gospel. That, that idea is here. But the other idea cannot be missed certainly because Jesus and the apostles extended that application and applied it to uh, the final literal destruction. Peter made it very clear. He, was, he repeated it and repeated it, and Jesus did too, that he was literally talking about uh, the physical destruction, the melting, the, the complete uh, erasure of the first heaven and earth and something new replacing that for the children of God. Now, uh, the, the same is true with uh, the word uh, or the idea of hell. I know um, there you have the materialist and of course some of our brethren such as Edward Fudge have also taught this idea that, that hell itself in the book of Isaiah is not talking about eternal torment, uh, but it's talking about the complete overthrow of the enemies of God. And of course, to some degree, that's true. But it does not capture all of what Jesus taught or of what Isaiah is talking about here. And I, we're gonna try to observe that as we read through these scriptures and, and realize it's not an either or. It's a both and. Okay? Now, uh, verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Okay? Uh, is, is he saying that in heaven we will not have any memory of what we did on the earth? I don't think that's his point. What former things is he most concerned about in all this context? Is it not the former things of sin and apostasy and corruption and all those things uh, that God had to punish, summarily punish? Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the context of Isaiah. God is about to unleash wrath and fury on the nation of Judah. And Judah and Israel are going to be 
decimated and left with very few survivors. And then those survivors will be carried away into captivity for 70 years. And then finally, the survivors, the remnant, those few who survive, will be brought back to uh, Israel. And, and they will live again in that land. And that, that, of course, is the backdrop of Isaiah. But from that, he jumps forward to the Christ and the great victory over sin that Christ will bring about, not just for Israel, but for all the nations of the earth. Fulfilling Genesis 12, one through three, the promise he made to Abraham, that in the seed of Abraham, God would bless all the nations of the earth. Now, let's keep reading. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create, for I, for behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall there be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. He says, I create Jerusalem to be a joy. Be a joy for whom? What do you think? He, he said, I will create Jerusalem to be a joy. And my question is, who's having the joy? Well, there's two possibilities. It's okay. People. It's, it's either God or the people who make up yes. this new kingdom of life. I think that's what he's wanting us to see. He wants us to become a joy for him. What is it the Bible says in the New Testament about when a sinner repents and what happens in heaven? Angels of heaven rejoice. There's joy in heaven. Okay. So there's joy in heaven when there is the salvation of the lost on this earth. So there'll be joy in heaven, but what about on earth? What happened when the Ethiopian eunuch was baptized there in Acts 8? After he was baptized, what did he do? He went on his way rejoicing. Uh, in Philippians 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice, rejoice the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Uh, there is... Count uh, it in all the, joy. When pardon? You, count it all joy when you fall into prison. Count it all, even in persecution. That's an important thought because we're going to get down to a place here where they, they will... There were, you will always dwell securely. No one will ever hurt you or harm you. How do you harmonize that with the persecution of the early church? And to the present day, is it true that no one will ever literally harm a Christian? I think it has to be taken into context. If you're not him who can destroy the body, you know, can destroy the soul, but put that in reverse. Right. And, and, and it's, it's, there is no... No harm when it right. comes to those that are permanent harm. Now, this is important for us to understand because uh, you understand that in many churches, in many preachers, uh, they can't comprehend this as applying to the age of Christ and of the church. They, they, this has got to be referring to something beyond. They get the idea of the thousand year reign when Christ will come back again. And he'll finally accomplish this. As if he did not accomplish that when he came the first time. And, and because uh, they'll ask the question. Well, uh, don't you see Satan how active he is? Don't you see how much people are being hurt? Don't you see there's, there's no peace for Christians? Well, what is Ephesians 2 talking about? Having peace with God and having peace one with another. Uh, having peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Uh, Romans 12, Peter or Paul commands the Christians, be at peace with all men, so, so far as it depends upon you. Now, if everybody heard that and accepted that, what would be the consequences? All, if all of us were trying with all of our heart, so far as it depends upon us, to be at peace with all men, how would life be? It would be great. And that would be peace, would it not? And everywhere the gospel is tried, there's peace. 
there's order. There's tranquility. There's prosperity. There's order. There's discipline. There's joy. That's all. Whenever you allow the gospel to be applied, that is the fruit. It's undeniable. Now, as you read here, he says, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. That is, I'm creating new heavens and a new earth. Now, that sounds like what he's saying is the creation of this new community, the kingdom of Christ. Uh, this, this new love, one for another. This love that's willing to die to save others. Now, he says uh, in verse 20 then, he says, uh, well, let me go ahead and finish 19. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall be heard the sound. Literally? Okay, I, that's got to be in the context of the cry and distress because of the enemy invaders, because of losing, losing to the enemy. And who is the enemy in the New Testament? Satan. It's Satan. What does the word Satan mean? Deceiver. The deceiver, the adversary, the enemy. Okay? Yeah, he is the deceiver. Uh, but that's the way in which he, he fights against us. And, and so uh, Ephesians 6, the last half of the chapter, he says, Our struggle is not with flesh and blood. What is it against? Principalities and powers in the heavenly places. That's our struggle. That's our war. We learned that in the teachings of Jesus Christ through the apostles. Now, as you continue reading verse 20, uh, no more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be. And my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. What's that about? What do you think? In, in the context of the prophets and of the history of Israel, in their experience, did they ever have the experience of the young man not reaching old age? Okay. Did they ever have the experience of planting a vineyard and not being able to eat the fruit of that vineyard? Why? Because they were invaded. Over and over again, they were invaded. That was their sad history. Why were they invaded? Because of their apostasy. And when God withdrew his hand from protecting them, I mean, as long as they walked with God, he was a wall of fire about them. Although they were a tiny nation in the midst of many great and powerful nations, nobody could touch, touch them. But when God withdrew his hand, then the enemies all around them began to have victories over them. And so uh, in the days of, of the judges, and you remember Gideon, remember uh, when God called Gideon, what was, what was he doing? Okay. Well, he, yeah, uh, he had, he had uh, uh, harvested some wheat. And he was threshing it in secret. He was threshing his wheat in secret. Lest those that were oppressing them came and took away. That's it. They didn't want to lose their harvest. Uh, because at harvest time, the Midianites would come sweeping out of the, the desert and fill their land like locusts, eating everything in sight. That was their historical experience. And God is saying, that's not going to happen anymore. Okay? How's that going to be? Is he talking about the millennial kingdom? See, and there's, there's another issue too. 
he was referring to to something still to come in our our future that you and me sit here today. Because the same paragraph that he says, I created a new heaven and a new earth, he uses the same word when he says, For behold, I create Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. You go to Hebrews 12 and we it says we come to Mount Zion to the we have come past him to Mount Zion in the heavenly Jerusalem. Yes, great point. Um, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. That that's a great it's a great example of how the language of Isaiah 65 here is used by the book of Hebrews to declare we are the new Jerusalem. It's, it's not for the future. It's already a present reality. And then, of course, the last chapter of Revelation. The new Jerusalem comes down from heaven adorned as a bride. Uh, we, have, we have the picture here of the ultimate success of the gospel. And here again, that has a double, double implication because uh, there in Ephesians 5, the bride of Christ, that's us. That's the church. When? When, when, do, when do we become the bride of Christ? Are we still waiting for that in the future? He's, no, he talks about it as a present reality. Because it is. And, but adorned, adorned how? Well, adorned by Jesus Christ, by his teaching, by, his, by the righteousness that he teaches us. When we behave the way he teaches us, we are adorned with what? We're adorned with good works. We're adorned with a great character. We're adorned with our love, our grace, our mercy, that which we show, our sacrifice, our diligence, and in, in our joy, the glory of our lives. That's, a, that's all adornment of uh, the bride of Christ. Now, let's uh, notice he just says, uh, and again in verse 22, uh, they shall not build another and, and, and another hab, inhabit. They shall not plant another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. My people, my chosen. Okay, First Peter 2 and uh, verse 9. Uh, we are the chosen people of God. Verse 10, those who were not a people of become my people, the people of God. He quotes that, of course, from Hosea. Hosea in chapter 3. The, you see, Hosea is contemporary with Isaiah. This theme uh, is born in prophecy at this time. The idea of God's people who were not a people who became the people of God. They are my people. And Ephesians chapter 1, 3 through 13, in Christ, all spiritual blessings are found where? In Christ. And among those spiritual blessings, he says, we are chosen in him. We become the elect. We become the chosen. Who are the chosen? They are the saints. They are the Christians. That's the language uh, that's born here of Isaiah. And then verse 23 uh, they shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. How about that? What does that mean? Before they call, I will answer. <clears throat> Did you ever pick up the phone to call somebody and they're already on the phone calling you I have I mean it's, it's really strange it's, and that, that happens in our lives in the electronic age that we live in because of people that that we love and that we have connection with and we frequently talk with um, but in this case he's talking not about a telephone he's talking about a prayer okay how is hey, what is he trying to express when he says uh, before they call. He knows you need before you ever ask. He does. Uh, 
One of the complaints that we sometimes have and that we sometimes make is, I pray and I pray and I pray and God does not hear me. He takes so long. Uh, it, it, it's so hard. I, 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 need, I need his help and I pray and I pray and I pray and it just seems like that God just doesn't answer. Well, I, I think we're being, we're being nearsighted about that. But certainly in the history of Israel, there's times, there were times because of their wickedness, they could cry out for, to God all they wanted to, but God would not hear them because they were estranged from him by their sins. And that's an earlier message, uh, was it back in chapter 59? Uh, their iniquities had separated them from their God. And so there could not be any communication. But here he's saying, not only will I hear you, but I'll hear you even before you call on me. Um, Jesus talked about prayer a whole lot. He said, um, knock and it shall be open to you. Seek and you shall find. What's the other word? Ask and it should be given to you. I don't have them in the right order, do I? Uh, I think the seeking is first. Is it seeking and knocking and asking? I can't, I can't remember. Um, you back but, up, you back up in Isaiah 55, and that's to seek the Lord while he may be found. Call yes. upon him while he is near. That's it. Exactly right. Uh, the idea of they shall call and I will answer. He's urging them to call, to seek him, of course. And that's the description here in this context as well. Uh, notice in verse 25, the wolf and the lamb shall, get, shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain says the Lord. Now, that language, we've already heard that back in chapter 11 of Isaiah. That's a great chapter. And I don't know if you've seen the Jehovah's Witness literature. They come knocking on your door and they have a picture on the front of their little track or booklet that they want to sell you. And it's a picture of a, a lion and a lamb. Or the, maybe it's a, it's, a, it's a child. It's a child. Beautiful pictures they have. Uh, there on, with his, his hand on the den of an asp or a snake, a serpent. Uh, they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. What is all that about? Well, they, they think the paradise is going to be on earth. Yes. When it's all done. And that on the earth, literally... Uh, lions are going to be grazing along with the oxen, and there will be no carnivores. So I guess we'll have, we can we're carnivores. What are we going to eat? We're going to be all vegetarians, I guess. That's supposed to be paradise. That's paradise. <laughs> no T-bone steaks now in paradise. Um, of course, in that in that language, he's talking about the peace with God. It's the peace. Now, and the commentary that we have in the Bible is found in the New Testament. If you want to know what the prophecies of the Old Testament mean, you've got to read the New Testament. There you have inspired commentary. It's like uh, uh, Peter says in 1 Peter 1. Uh, we have a, a better understanding because the Holy Spirit has revealed the significance of all of those prophecies. If you want to know what the peace was in these prophecies, you've got to read what the gospel says, as we said a while ago in Ephesians chapter 2. The peace between God and man and the peace among men. Of all races, of all nations, uh, laying down their arms. Now that's, <laughs> uh, that's pretty significant to see people, uh, considering that the history of humanity has been that of constant warfare between every tribe, 
uh, there's discussions about why couldn't the uh, American Indian tribes get along? Why were they always killing each other? I mean, they, they, had, they had no word for friend. Uh, the, word, uh, the word for stranger was the word for enemy. Anybody you didn't know, that was your enemy. And your whole instinct was to kill your enemy if you can, if you can get away with it. Um, but that was not unique to them. They were just like all the tribes of Asia and of Europe and of Africa and of South America and all over the world. It was blood shed always. And it was warfare between one tribe and another tribe. And then Jesus came and what did he teach? Yet we have to love one another, even your enemies, Matthew 5 and 32, 33. We must love them even if they misuse us. There's no, we're not allowed to have blood feuds, okay? You know, if the Hatfields uh, attack the McCoys, the McCoys have got to attack the Hatfields. And if everyone who is killed has to be avenged. And as, um, what was his name uh, in the book of Genesis, of, of Cain's descent, he said, for every wound I receive, I'm, if, you know, I'm going to avenge seven times. So you kill one of mine, I kill seven of yours. And that's the language of the fleshly world as it is and as it has been for thousands and thousands of years. Who changed it? Jesus. Jesus did. Why do we have all this moral discussion about genocide? What's wrong with genocide? I mean, that's the great moral evil. They're talking about in, in, in the war between uh, Hamas and Israel over there, and, and they accuse each other of genocide. And so I say, so what? What's wrong with genocide? It's not love. The only one who condemned genocide was Jesus. The only one that ever made that morally evil was Jesus. Before Jesus, there was no concept of it being wrong to commit murder against your enemies or against your your neighbors, your, your, tri uh, your other tribes, your, your other cultures and peoples. To wipe them out, thousands of people, it was right. Because you're better, you're stronger, and you can take their goods, and you become wealthy, and they become nothing. That's been world history. Jesus has changed that. Now, um, that is... The wolf and the lamb grazing together. That only happens, though, among those who accept the message. But they've had a profound effect. Because all these people who talk about how evil genocide is, they're not Christians. But they believe it's evil. Have you ever thought about that? If they don't believe in Christ, if they don't believe in the gospel, upon what moral basis can they condemn it? They can't. Now, Continuing into chapter 66, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me and what is the place of my rest? Um, that was uh, Solomon. The great accomplishment of Solomon was he built the house of God. Remember that? Uh, 1 Kings 8 and 27. Uh, Solomon acknowledges that the heavens and the heavens of the heavens cannot contain God. And so how much less this house that I have built? How about that? Uh, but that was always a problem. And, and after the days of Isaiah, the days of Jeremiah, uh, the people justified their uh, sinfulness and their apostasy and their rebellion. It, 
And when, when the prophet Jeremiah was saying that God was going to destroy them, because they said, they said, no, no, no. The temple of the Lord is this. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. Uh, in the previous chapter, that's Jeremiah 7 and 4. Uh, go back to chapter 6 and 14. Uh, th these people have healed the hurt of my people, uh, saying peace when there is no peace. All of that idea, the false and deceptive words of that time uh, surrounded the idea of the temple that Solomon had built. Uh, they, were, they, they believed God could not destroy Jerusalem because that's where the temple of God is located. He couldn't do it. But Solomon knew better than that. He made the house and he knew better than that. Of course he can. Um, and God gave it to him with a stipulation. That's a stipulation. They had to be true to him to maintain. The, the, the temple in Jerusalem was not for God to dwell in. It was for the Israelites to seek God in that temple. It gave, he gave them a, a focal point where they could go and seek God. But in chapter 7 and 14 of Jeremiah, he writes, Therefore I will do to this house as I did to Shiloh. Okay? What was Shiloh? By the way, what does the word mean? Shiloh, Shalom, how about it? Peace, okay? The, the, the city of Shiloh is where the tabernacle, the tent, was parked uh, before it was lost. And then later, uh, David, of course, uh, uh, bought at the, the temple mount where later Solomon built uh, the new temple, and it was of uh, wood and stone. Uh, but before that, until from the days of Moses to the days of Solomon, the house of God was a tent, and it was parked there in Shiloh. And it was there for hundreds and hundreds of years. They think they found the place over there, the archaeologists have. And uh, you, it's because it's so worn around there and the location of the poles where they sunk down into the rock that held up the tent apparently is right there. You can see it. But what happened to that house? No longer, it no longer existed in the days of Jeremiah. And he says God could do it then. God let them lose the ark to the Philistines. He did, didn't he? Yeah. And before the days of Jeremiah were over, the temple was no longer there. And then it was gone. Or it was still. Completely gone. And Jeremiah lived to see that. And that, that generation who heard these words, they lived to see that. Uh, verse 2 all these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. That verse is very, very important. That's fundamental to all the Bible. Uh, you have Psalm 51. David, after he was rebuked for the sin with Bathsheba, and when he's pouring his heart out to God and is expressing his gratitude for God's forgiveness, you have him acknowledging this very same truth. Who is it? He says, God does not seek sacrifice. What does he want? He wants a poor and contrite heart. He wants a humble, contrite spirit that trembles at my word. Um, what is there to tremble about? <laughs> uh, you can't read the Bible without finding reason to tremble in God's presence. People do tremble. People tremble Absolutely. Well, uh, I know that you have seen the horrors of war. And the horrors of war remind us of how terrible life can be on this earth. 
how terrible the wrath of God can be when it is poured out in, in warfare as it has been over and over again throughout human history. You can read it in the history books, Civil War and other places. It's very vivid. Very vivid. It's very horrible. When you, if, you can, if you can just try to imagine, of course, in the days when they didn't have guns and bombs, they had swords, and what did they do with swords? Well, they would not just run you through, they'd cut you into pieces, you know? So you have, you look at a battlefield after the war, after the battle is over, and when you, you see body parts, and you have a river of blood. Each of these bodies has bled out, and there's blood all over the ground. And you have to walk through that. This is, this is the misery of the great terror and wrath of God. He says, yes, we all have reason to tremble at the word of God. Because at the word of God, men live and die. Verse 3, he who slaughters an ox is like one who kills a man. He who sacrifices a lamb like one who breaks a dog's neck. He who presents a grain offering like one who offers pig's blood. He who makes a memorial offering of frankincense like one who blesses an idol. These have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations. I also will choose harsh treatment for them and bring their fears upon them. Because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not listen, but they did what was evil in my eyes and chose that in which I did not delight. What's going on here? He who sacrifices a lamb like one who breaks a dog's neck. Is he talking about the abolition of the law of Moses? No, he's not talking about that here. I've, I've heard preachers use it that way. That's not what in Amos the same thing. He says when he hates, uh, you know, their new, new moon sacrifices and all that. Isaiah chapter one, the same thing. You have chapter one at the very beginning of Isaiah. Uh, he is saying, uh, verse fourteen: Your new moons, your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread your out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. That's why. That's why he hates the worship. You think about men today who go out and do savage things, dirty, filthy, immoral things, but they're Johnny on the spot on Sunday morning, and they're singing hymns to God. What do you think God thinks about that? Well, for Finally, he's worshiping me. You think God's thinking that? No, I don't think so. Well, at least he goes to church. At least he goes to church, you know. He may be a beast at home with his wife. He may be uh, completely filthy and immoral at work. But at least he goes to church. God hates that. Which means God hates hypocrisy. And did you see that in Jesus when he walked among the Pharisees and the scribes? Matthew 23 is the scorching chapter in the book of Matthew because he's speaking of how much he detests the life of these he called hypocrites. It's always been that way. It always will be. And that's what he's saying here. They've chosen their own ways. Okay? Remember Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. What are the your ways? It's these ways right here. They've chosen their own ways. They're not God's ways. They've chosen that which they want. I called, no one answered. I spoke, and they did not listen. But they did what was evil in my eyes and chose that in which I did not delight. This reminds us, 
what the gospel actually challenges us to do in the authority of Christ is to seek that which is a delight in Jesus' name. Why is it that we seek command, example, and necessary inference? Why do we do that? It's not just because he's king of kings and lord of lords. It's because we seek that which is a delight in his eyes. We want to see any hint in the scriptures that teaches, that suggests, this is what he delights in. And we, because we love him, because we seek his favor, we want to do that. That's our motivation to study carefully, to be scrupulous in our obedience. Is scrupulous obedience corrupt and evil? The modern generation says so, but not the sincere Christian, because that's what you will do if you want the ways of God. Um, and I know we're gonna have differences on what's because of our scruples, what is the best thing to do? And we need to cut each other some slack, but this is what we should be looking for and trying always to find, what does God want me to do? Okay, I didn't quite finish my chapter, did I? Just remember, uh, as we get through with this, he's speaking of the, the joy and the glory um, as he says in verse uh, 18, uh, he says, For I know their works and their thoughts. The time is coming. Remember the, in Revelation, I know your works. I know your works. Seven times he said, I know your works. I know their works and their thoughts. Their way and their thoughts. And the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues. And they shall come and shall see my glory. And I will set my sign among them. And from them I will send survivors to the nations. I'm going to send survivors, okay, the saved, to the nations, to Tarshish and Paul and Lud, who draw the bow to Tubal and jo uh, Javan, or Javan, to the coastlands far off that have not heard my fame or seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the nations. That's the beautiful message of Isaiah. And... I've enjoyed this very much in being with you and talking about these things. I pass the torch to someone else tonight.